Hello and welcome to week two of this Open SAP course. My name is Tara Reapy. My colleagues Karsten Varnica, Michael Roth and I will be taking you through this week in seven units dedicated to migration, output management, web services and extraction. Together we hope you find the sessions informative and useful. I would like to begin this week by discussing the topic of migration. In this unit, I will provide an overview of the migration process, along with a demo to dive right in and show you the process, how it actually works. Seeing this at the start of the week should set the context of the next units for you and allow you to visualize what you are learning with how it can be applied. Over time, systems evolve and the needs of a company will change. After years of using one product, or indeed using several products separately to keep track of everything coming into and going out of a company, it might be time to use one solution that can handle the whole end-to-end -end process. It is unlikely that when choosing SAP Business by Design that there is no historical data for the company in question. And so the need for a data migration solution is quite important. The migration process considers data which is of operational importance, that is, master data such as companies, customers, suppliers, products, and also transactional data such as open and payables items, outgoing checks, and so on. We need to ensure that after the go-live date, everything continues as normal in the new system, with all the legacy data safely set up in the new system. The steps to achieve this in simple terms are to extract the legacy data, cleanse the data to only migrate what is necessary to migrate, and to transform this data to match the setup of the by design environment. By starting over in the by design system with as lean and clean data as possible, we can ensure that nothing is lost and that business continuity is maintained. It should be as simple as turning off one light and turning on another over the course of one go-live weekend to ensure the data transition takes the least possible time. I will now show you a simple migration of materials. Each of the various migration activities can be found in the Business Configuration Work Center. Once you open the activity you require, in my case, migration of materials, you will see an option to read about the migration, which contains documentation about each of the tabs and fields. And you will also be able to open the migration tool, which is where we will do the migration. This will open a new tab. Within this tab, the migration workbench, we can upload a file, which we have already prepared using the Excel templates that SAP provides, or we can create a new file from scratch. I've already prepared an Excel file, so I will upload this file now. Once the data is uploaded, you'll be able to see it here also, and you can edit it without having to edit the Excel file itself. It's important to note that you do not have to enter data in each and every field or in each and every tab. But if you have got data filled in a particular tab, you must fill in the mandatory fields which are highlighted with an asterisk. I will now migrate this file. You have an option to execute step by step or immediately. If you execute immediately and any errors occur, a Delta file will be created. I will execute step by step and I will explain the steps along the way. The first step is the validation step. In this step, we validate the data that has been input in the file. We ensure that mandatory fields have been populated. We ensure that the data types match the fields. Uh, for example, if you have a date field that must be populated and you've populated with text, you would get an error message to tell you that it is not the right type. Or if you have a text field that requires no more than 30 characters and, and you have 35 characters, we would inform you that we will truncate this data. You can also run this activity in the background. What this means is the, the activity will continue to run and you can 
perhaps upload further files or continue on with different business that you want to do. And whenever you have time to come back and check on the validation, you simply need to execute step by step once again. And it'll pick up where it had left off or if it had already finished, it, it would show you that it had already finished. So the validation now has been finished. Close this. There were no errors, thankfully. All my file was, was clean. And I move on to the next step. The next step is the value conversion step. And here we take the source values from the Excel, which would be the values from your legacy system, and we translate them into values from the target system, which is the by design system now. So for example, your company ID perhaps in your legacy system was different to the company ID now in the by design system, you would be able to do a mapping between those here. And if it is in fact the same, and you already have this company in the by design system, it would automatically be proposed for you and all you would need to do is confirm. In my case, this has already been confirmed through another migration that has been done and I don't need to confirm this again. This is a nice feature of the migration. All the rest of the values have already been maintained, so I will move to the next step. And this is the simulation step. And what happens here is we take this data that has been provided in the file. Using the value conversion, we map it into something that is readable by our by design system. So we understand the values and their IDs that we have in our system. And we create a, an XML payload, which is sent in through a web service to our system. And we mimic exactly what will happen during the import, except we stop just before the data is actually saved. So here we can uh, figure out any errors that may occur during the same or during the import um, before you actually go ahead and do the import. So the only situation that isn't replicated is if uh, some error may occur during the save itself. In that case, the import will finish but if the uh, if the record failed for whatever reason um, a delta file will be created and that record will not be imported so my simulation step has finished i have an error here that i would need to correct and my error basically tells me that some data that i have already exists for a different material that i have and if i edit the source record it'll take me directly to the place where I need to go and change this data. So this supplier part number already exists for another material, so I will change it. I'll save the data. And I can simulate this once again. Uh, you may have noticed there we can simulate for all records um, or only the records that have changed. So in a case where you have 1000 records in your file, and only five of these records actually needed to be changed, then you can simulate only those five records and, and it will save some time on the simulation step. This is another step that you can run in the background, the same as the validation step. So if you have other tasks that you want to complete, you can always leave this and come back later. So the simulation has finished now. My error has been resolved and there's no further errors caused by what I've changed. So I move on to the next step and I agree that everything is okay and I understand that if something has gone wrong, um, I can't undo it and I agree to import this data. So all the steps that have been followed in the simulation are now being executed once again. The only difference is at the end of it, this will actually be saved. I can also execute this step in the background. This step is now also complete. I'll close this. I finish my migration. And now I will search for this material that I've just created. So this is the one that I've created just now. 
and you can verify that all the data that you have filled in in each of the tabs and each of the fields has been populated correctly here. That is the migration of materials. I hope this was a good overview of what's to come. And I'll now pass over to Karsten, who will talk you through the migration process in more detail. Thank you, Tara. As Tara said, my name is Carsten Warnicke. Let's have a look at the data migration process. First, schedule. Since data migration is a critical part in every project, you need to make sure that you schedule your data migration activities. This schedule has, of course, to be integrated in the overall implementation schedule. We also provide a nice accelerator called the Data Migration Scope and Planning Template which will help you to organize your data migration. I will show you later in the demo where to find and how to use that tool. Second, clans. One of the first tasks after the SAP Business by Design kickoff meeting are the data cleansing activities. As we say, garbage in, garbage out. It is very important to migrate high quality data from your legacy system to SAP Business by Design. Otherwise, many of the business value of the implementation of SAP Business by Design will be sacrificed to bad data. The end user would need to do a lot of correction in the early use of SAP Business by Design, which could be very frustrating for them. We recommend doing the data cleansing already in the legacy system before extracting data. The reason for that is that data cleansing needs to be done by the data owners and they are normally very used to the legacy system. Extract data. Before you extract data from your source system, you may want to make yourself familiar with the migration templates since this might impact how you want to extract that data. In step 4, you will populate the migration templates. You should follow Tara's tips and tricks. The step 5, test migration, will be done when the fine tuning is finished and the data migration templates are populated. It is very important that you verify in step 6 the quality of the data. To be compliant, it is for example necessary that the opening balance sheet match to the data of your legacy system. We will have a deeper look at this topic in Unit 4. Finally, after the readiness acceptance, you will initiate the final cutover. Since this is the most hectic phase in the project, you should prepare that task with the cutover schedule accelerator. You have seen the data migration process. Let's now move on to the demo. So let me log on to the system. Let's navigate to the business configuration work center. Let me open the activity list. If I navigate to the prepare phase, you will see an activity called prepare for data migration. If I open that, there's also a task create a project schedule for data migration. If I click on that link, I will be transferred to the help.sap.com page. There I can download the accelerator. Let's now have a look at the accelerator. You can see that this accelerator is a Microsoft Excel tool. In the first column you can decide which data object I want to put into the project scope. Second column shows the application area. And here in the third column, you see the go-live activity in the system, which will link you to the system. 
Also very important, the sequence number. Since the data load needs to follow that sequence. Um, to give you an example, it's only possible to create my banks if before that the bank directory is also migrated to the system. So please be very aware of the sequence no number, otherwise you will have difficulties to migrate your data. You can also add project management specific information like the customer owner, like the name of the partner consultant who need to support the customer owner. You can define a priority. You can store the number of records which will indicate the effort for the data migration. You can also nail down the data source. This is especially important if you have more than one data source for the same data. And you can also indicate the quality of the legacy data, since this will also indicate the effort. Finally, you can also decide whether you want to go for a manual data migration or a template-based data migration. So this ends now my demo. Yeah, I will be back in Unit 4. So thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hello again and welcome back to week two, Migration Input and Output. My name is Tara Ripi and I'll be taking you through Unit 3, Migration Tips and Tricks. There are many useful features of the Migration Workbench and I'd like to talk you through a few of them, which should help with your daily work um, in making it kind of quicker and more efficient to do your migrations on the test and, and productive systems. Our system allows you to import and export value conversion files. This saves the duplication of work between the test environment and the productive environment or any other systems. You can download files. Again, this is a good way to reuse files that you've already verified in, in, in your test system. You can reuse them directly in the productive environment. You can also adjust settings for parallel processing. This can help to reduce the time taken if you've got a particularly large file and it can optimize the number of processes for your specific needs. We'll also create delta files where there are erroneous records. Um, so instead of sacrificing the entire migration for the sake of a couple of erroneous records, we'll create a new file with those records that you can migrate separately and we'll go ahead with the migration for the records which have no errors. I'd like now to show you a demo of the above in the system. So this is a screen that you might be familiar with from an earlier unit. This is the migration workbench for the materials. The first thing I'd like to show you is the export of the value conversion. <clears throat> this can be done on a file level or on an object level. If you would like to download the value conversion for a particular file, you select the file which you want to download the value conversion for, click Actions, Click download value conversion. This will download a text file with the values which you have maintained for this specific file. It will not download all of the values for all of the files. However, you can do this through the you can also button. Here we also have an export value conversion to file, and this takes every value conversion for the object. So for all of the files that have been done here, all of the values will be exported and they will come in a .d or v format. You can also import the value conversion from the same file. So a common use case for this would be if you have your migration complete in your test system and you would like to do it in your productive environment, you might not want the replication of work of redoing the value conversion again. So you would export the value conversions 
to to a file from here in your test system and when you're starting your migration in your productive system you would import the value conversion from that same file you also have an option to download the files that, that, that are completed or indeed any files that you'd like to edit offline or anything like that. To do that, you select the file that you would like to download, click on Actions and click Download. This will download in an XML format and it is simply the migration template um, filled in with all of the data. So it looks the same as the original template that you may have uploaded to the system. This can be useful if you have already uploaded your Excel template. You might have made some changes on the fly due to some errors um, or just some information that you felt was missing. You might have added it in without re-downloading the file, without re-uploading an Excel template. So you might want to use that particular template again with the edits in place. So you just simply download it from here. And also, again, it's just another way to avoid too much replication of work if you were happy with the file that you uploaded directly into your test system and it has gone through fine and the migration is okay you might want to download that file itself directly um, as well as the value conversion and just re-upload that because you know that you're happy with it in your productive system you can also enable parallel processing or adjust settings for parallel processing. It, it's not enabled for every object, but it is there for some objects and it is there for the materials and, and most of the master data objects this would be available for. What this means is that for each work process contains a certain number of records. For example, imagine that we have in the materials, there are 25 individual records per work process. If we've got the number of parallel work processes set as four, this means four units of 25 each will be processed in parallel with each other. Meaning instead of 25 records being processed at a time, we will actually have 100 records processed at a time. And this is through four work processes that are happening at the same time. So this reduces the overall time taken, particularly if you would have a, a particularly large file. Um, but it comes with the caveat that you shouldn't just set this to, you know, a, a really high number in the hope that it will um, increase your or decrease your processing time to almost zero because there comes a breaking point where in fact you're not saving any time and, and you're actually increasing processing time because of the parallelization. It has been found through our testing that between 8 and 12 is the optimum for most of the objects and anything beyond that actually tends to reduce the performance overall. So we would recommend sticking within those limits. But it can be very useful if you've got a very large file. It can really help to, to take the time down. Another very useful feature that I mentioned in my earlier demo is the creation of Delta files. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to upload a file. You might remember in the previous demo, we executed step by step. In this case, I will show you how the execute data import immediately works. When I click this button, it just does all of the steps sequentially without your input to say, move on to the next, move on to the next. And you're going straight to the uh, execution of the import. If there are values that remain to be converted. You would be informed of these through a, through an error message, and they wouldn't they wouldn't happen. It's also a process that you can run in the background and come back to later to see how it's going. 
So in this file, I have two records that I'm trying to upload. So now I can see from my error log that there was an error with one of my records. I can also see that I was trying to upload two records and in fact only one of them was imported. One of them had an error and was not imported. So if I finish this import now, again I can see my results and I have a little information here that a new file has been created with the records that had failed or hadn't imported successfully. And I'll show you this file now. You can, you can click it from here. I'll show you from the workbench itself. So what I have now is I have a file that we call a Delta file. And it's got the same file name with Delta at the end. And it just contains the record that wasn't updated correctly, wasn't imported correctly with, with this data migration. So what I can do is I can start the migration again with this file and I can correct whatever the, the error was. It was again to do with, the, with something that already existed. So I simply change that and then I do the migration again and it imports that correctly. And this is particularly useful if you have thousands of records and for some reason two or three of them have some sort of error you shouldn't not be able to import thousand the rest the, the three thousand records that are working fine when only a couple of records have an error so that that's the idea behind the delta file creation there is also a useful feature where you can enhance records that already exist so I created this material earlier through the import that I've just done. And now I can enhance the data. So when I uploaded this data, I had, for example, one financial, I didn't even have a financial organization for it. And now I've decided, you know, I actually do need this financial organization and I need this for many other materials as well. I can create a file, actions create, give it a file name. And I change the migration mode from add new records to enhance already existing records. So what we have here, you may not have all of the same tabs as in the creation file. And within these tabs, you may not even have all of the fields available. So you'll even notice that we're missing the general tab. Uh, from here, there, there, there are certain fields and tabs that uh, are not allowed to be enhanced. But if they're not allowed to be enhanced, they will not appear on this template. And much like the original template, you do not have to fill in every field in order to in order to allow this to go through. If you are filling in some details, for example, if I was filling in the other languages tab, I would need to maintain uh, each of the key fields here. But for example, if I was maintaining information in the purchasing tab, I would just need to maintain these three key fields and I wouldn't have to maintain internal comment. It's not mandatory. But you'll notice that there are a lot fewer fields available in, in enhancement mode. But again, it's quite a, a useful feature in such cases where you may not have had all of the data available to you when you were doing the initial migration but you have it now and you want to update and again for example i'll take the financial organizations if you have a thousand materials and you you forgot to add in one financial organization for each of them this is a good way to kind of save that extra bit of work
um, in just updating them manually. You can you can do it from here instead with the enhancement. One final um, point that I would like to inform you of is the ability to actually edit within the tool itself. So you, I mentioned you can download the files and you can, uh, but you don't have to download and then edit in Excel and then upload it again. You can actually edit it directly from here. And we saw that in the previous demo when there was an error message and, and we edited the file. So to bring your attention to it, there are a number of tabs that, that could be hidden. Um, if you want to make sure that you're seeing absolutely everything that's available, firstly, you can click this show all tabs button. So any tabs that might not have been shown before um, would show up now. Any tabs that would be hidden by default in the Excel, for example, that you can show them by the show standard tabs. And any fields that might be hidden by default in the Excel can be shown if you click on this maximum view. So this is now showing absolutely everything and I can edit it here. And I can also do what's known as a mass change. So this works if I've got, you know, many materials that I want to change the product category of, for example, I can say, I want to set a new value altogether and you can actually replace the value. So I can say I have product category A and I would like to replace it with product category B and apply the mass change and every material on this sheet, on this tab would then get replaced with my new product category B. So they are some useful tips and tricks to make the whole migration process a little bit easier for you. I hope this has been informative for you and I hope you've enjoyed the sessions. Best of luck with the, the, the tests and uh, I hope your migrations go well. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Unit 4 in Week 2. My name is Carsten Warnecke and today I will talk about the financial migration and reconciliation. Tara has already presented the data migration process to you. Why is this unit dedicated to financial data migration? Basically, there are two reasons. First, the financial data migration process differs as slightly from the migration process Tara demonstrated to you. Second, for compliance reason, it is very essential that you load a complete and consistent set of data. When the financial data migration is messed up, it is not possible to fulfill the legal requirements for statutory reports like balance sheet and income statement. For that reason, financial data migration needs to be accurate. What about reconciliation? As I said in Unit 1, it is very important that data is loaded with good quality to SAP Business by Design. With data reconciliation, you validate the quality of the data migration. Therefore, this is a very important step of the readiness acceptance milestone. When it comes to the financial data migration, the first thing you need to consider is the migration date. You need a cutoff date at which you move from your legacy system to SAP Business by Design. This date is also called the Go Live date and it needs to be considered by the project manager in his or her project schedule. From an accounting perspective, this date is either a mid year migration or after closing financial statements. The audit of the next year is easier when you migrate after closing financial statements since all relevant data for the audit trail is in one system. But you also need to be aware that accountants are normally blocked with period and closing activities at that period. For the final cutover activities including financial migration, 
The business is normally shut down for a weekend. Since you do not want to extend that shutdown time due to the financial impact, you are in a better position if you are perfectly prepared with a detailed cutover plan. Knowing the learning curve, it is also a very good idea if you already did a financial migration. For that, you could use any complete and consistent set of financial data so the project team is already trained. Be creative. Maybe you will find measures to make the financial migration as easy as possible. Running a payment run before extracting the open items payables would reduce the amount of data dramatically. And you should definitely do the VAT or sales tax declaration in your legacy system before the final cutover. Following these re recommendations will mitigate risk. Be aware that with the first financial audit, the auditor will also validate the opening balances within SAP Business by Design. Therefore, it is highly recommended that you document adequately. As I said, it is extremely important that you import a complete and consistent set of financial data of a company. Complete means containing general ledger data and all sub-ledger data. Therefore, the import uploads all source files with your complete financial data at the same time with a single push of a button. To allow that, you create a migration unit for each company's financial data. This graphics represents the financial migration process. Step 1, process files will be executed for each source file. When all source files are processed, the system allows you to cross-check balances to make sure to have a complete and consistent set of data. Only when this is the case, the import should be executed. SAP Business by Design does not allow any change of the import later on. Let's have a look at the posting logic. When you migrate the subledger's objects, the amounts are posted on the GL accounts of the corresponding subledgers. Furthermore, if you migrate GL account balances, the amounts are posted on the GL accounts of the corresponding subledgers as well. This way, the same amount would be posted twice on the GL account. To avoid this, the GL accounts that you assign to the corresponding GL account in the SAP Business by Design solution are forwarded automatically to migration clearing accounts. The following graphics describe the posting logic during migration using the example of open items payables. Migration of the open item source file posts the value to the GL accounts for domestic payables and to the migration clearing account for payables. The sum of open items payable is also migrated with the GL account balance source file. This will post the same sum to the other side of the migration clearing accounts for payables and to special GL accounts for data migration. This account avoid that the same sum of open items payables is posted to the GL account for domestic payables twice. I will show you later on in the demo. This cross balance check already shows a very important part of reconciliation. You should check the quality of the data migration for all data migration activities. You can find details in the help of the migration activity. For example, you can verify migrated customers in the Account Management Work Center or in the Business Partner Data Work Center. Compare the data in your legacy system with the data that has been migrated to SAP Business by Design. 
check a certain number of record to ensure that the values in both systems match. We have seen the special characteristics of the financial migration. Let's now move on to the demo. So let me navigate now to the business configuration work center and let me open the activity list. I already assigned this activity, migration of accounting transaction data to the corresponding using user. So if I open this activity, I can also open now the migration workbench. I created a specific migration unit for this company, Almika Deutschland GmbH. Within that migration unit, I also added different migration objects. And you can see they're all ready for import. Two migration objects are marked with a red traffic light. So I did not upload that one since they are not relevant for that specific company. So if I now execute the migration, you can see again my migration scope with all the migration objects are already processed. If I click next now, you can see the cross-check balance. And this posting preview is for per company and per set of books. In my company, I now have three set of books, but let's focus on the first one. So let me close that one. So, so in, now you can see my little example with the GL accounts. If I check now, for example, the trade payables domestic, you can see that this sum basically is filled with the migration objects for open items payables. I can see the details here now, if I want. And you can see I build a very easy example, which means that one will be filled really with the migration objects with the subledger. If I now check the balance carry forward account, you can see that I have a sum of zero, which means one is also filled with the uh, subledger migration object, and one is uh, replaced by the migration clearing account. And with that, uh, we avoid to bring the sum twice on that specific account since it's redirected to that account. And yeah, the check I need to, do, need to do is vary if this sum ends up with a zero. If that is the case, sub ledger and general ledger are in sync. So if I do my validation by checking the posting preview, I can check mark that I reviewed the posting values carefully and then I can carry on with the migration. There I get another hint that I really need to check the data since it's not possible to um, correct data later on. And if I click now on yes, the data would be loaded to the system. Let me click on cancel now. So, and now how to validate or reconciliate again. For that, we have also a detailed description in the documentation. So if I read about migration of financial transaction data and check the GL account balances, how I could check that one. Basically, let me scroll down now. And now you can see the follow-on activities are basically use the trial balance report in the general ledger work center to check the trial balances 
You can also check the financial statements whether they fit, or you can also do a reconciliation between the general ledger and the sub-ledger. Okay, so this ends now my little demo and my unit 4. Thank you very much and goodbye. Welcome back to the OpenSAP course for key users in SAP Business by Design. My name is Michael Roth and I'm a member of the product management team for this solution. And today it is about output management. And this means it's somehow about this. I'm a customer of the Almica model company and I received an invoice letter. And the interesting question is how did the data from the by design system end up on this paper? Well, let's see. Many standard processes in business by design at some point trigger an output. Let's take a customer invoice. At the moment where this is being released, the invoice is being put to a queue and someone is being made responsible for taking care of that and similarly for other processes. While well, some user is being made responsible, hmm, that user could be me. Um, let's check. I go to home, manual print tasks. Oh, indeed, I'm responsible for the output of three documents. I wasn't aware. Not necessarily it is the user who clicked the release. With the customer invoice it is, but with other processes it might be just someone related having a role in that. So here is some room for improvement. In any case, some automation will be helpful here. And I might really want to consider to centralize that. So, here means I start already collection, collecting requirements. When I start centralizing, I could quickly get the requirements, for example, to have another copy for internal purposes, let's say, printed out from a different printer at a different location. And maybe some refinements to that. How would I address such kind of um, requirements. Well, different printing sounds like I need more than one queue to distinguish. Indeed I do. And if I have more than one queue, I need then a rule to tell the system when to take which of the queues. And both is something you find in the application and user management work center. So, here the email and fax queues and here let's go today to the printing, the print queues. And down here we have the default queue that is already available. And this is exactly what we have observed, the printing by document owner. And now we want to introduce the other paradigm. We want to introduce, say new, this, therefore we need a, a new queue. We need to give a, a name, but the most important part is we need to select here, no longer printing by document owner, but we want to have a central printing via the Cloud Print Manager, a piece of software, not a user that is taking care of that. But also here, a user is required for the authorization checks, but only this time, this is not a, a business user, this is a technical user. The system suggests its name like this one. In any case, I need to give uh, credentials here. I need to create credentials here. And please remember that user, because whatever you give here, you will need later. I actually created already for us these two queues, one for the external print, one for the internal print, and both, of course, with the paradigm central printing by the print manager. Be aware that you have here some additional information. You could have under process documents, see the queue itself, and up here you have a test print functionality that can also be very helpful. Now we need the rules to tell the system when to do, when to use which of the queues. The rules are down here in the output channel selection. And here for every document group, and we are looking into the group of customer invoice like documents, we can have some rules. How are these rules working? Let's go to the bottom and, and just look into the details of these rules. 
the rules is actually collecting here what's to do. And this means here, go via the output channel printer to the one queue that I had created and put one copy there and then go again a printing task, but this one time to the other queue and again one copy, plus, but this time mark it as duplicate please. And this is now the requirement and what to do. Now let's see, let's assume we have some refinements. This is about the group of customer invoice like documents, which contains, for example, also performer invoices. Performer invoices are not real actual invoices. So maybe I do not want to have them as paper. I want to send them via email only. And then it contains also things like debit notes. And maybe we have the decision that these ones we do not want to output at all. So how could that be accomplished? That can be accomplished by creating additional rules. Let's take this middle rule here. This middle rule says for a performer invoice, if the business document, which is the detail type within the group of customer invoice-like documents, if that is a performer invoice, then actually please do the following. Take an email and as a sender, use the organizational unit, just a quick look. You could alternatively also actually give an explicit address or take the company email address as sender email. But in any case, up here, I think you see already how this works. This is the condition under which this rule applies. And this is now we made it dependent on the business document. Alternatively, we could also create rules which are speci for specific recipients, built to, or are for specific senders, the organizational unit that is actually issuing the um, customer invoice. And, now, and similarly up here now you see I have created a rule with um, debit notes and used actually as output channel do not send. Well what output channels do we have by the way? Okay we have seen all of them already meanwhile fax is clear, email, external system what is that? Well that is something where this output mechanism is used for an integration scenario with another system. Yeah? So this output is creating a message that is being sent over the internet to another system um, and supporting collaboration scenarios, integration scenarios that are pre-configured in Business by Design. A uh, prominent example here would be a kind of, uh, would be uh, intercompany scenario where maybe even both companies of, the, of a group um, are using by design and using this integration scenario here to, um, to trigger business processes to each other via the output from the one business process, let's say purchase order is triggering something for sales orders on the other side or similar. Now we have several rules. How would the system know which to take? Well, it checks from top to bottom and so means in order to make this work, you need to put the specific rules to the top so that they are found first and the more generic rules to the bottom. So if the first rules don't apply, the last one catches on. And means in that combination, we have already completed, fulfilled these requirements. What I didn't tell you is that the functionality that we had used has been is not visible by default in your system, but it's in the system you just need to make it um, active, activated in the business configuration. Here to the left is the navigation path and here to the right are the two, are the two questions. The first one is the important package of multiple output channel functionality. I recommend you to you that you activate that uh, by answering this question with a checkbox. Yes, mm, it contains functionality that had been requested uh, via customer influence documents pretty heavily. We are proud of that uh, functionality. And the second part is don't be misled by, by the wording. Do you want to have the option? to have a do not send um, channel where you can disable automatic printing for this specific way, not, not in general. As usual, 
once you have completed some requirements, new requirements are immediately there. Let's assume that we get an addition now the request that um, some customers actually do not want to have paper. They want to have emails as that for the invoices sent. Then also another uh, requirement saying, okay, and for one specific case that actually usually does want paper, only today they want in addition for this specific case in email. How do we accomplish this? Well, it's not too difficult. The one is in the um, customer master data. If you go to the master, customer master data, view all and to the communication collaboration area, then you will actually find for a number of document groups a functionality similar to the one that you have just seen. Also here you can indicate output channel settings. I just gave you an email and an address then of course, and you could also have in, in addition add some CC and BCC uh, addresses for this and choose a template and create a rule for this account specifically. So if I have a rule here that then somehow is in conflict with the generic rule that we have given before, how does this work? Well, the account specific rule here takes priority over everything else. Uh, so what you'd make here is what you get. And now the other question would be, in any case, the system derived now, let's say, an output, but today I want to have it differently. Yeah, then let's go into this uh, customer invoice, which has not been released yet. Then you have, you can also edit the output settings. Yeah. And if you edit the output settings, then you actually see what we expected. Well, we see the two printings that we have uh, defined, the one internal, the one external. What today, if I want to have it differently, yeah, let's say add row and actually I want to have it, little, need to go a little down, here, yeah. email. And then a similar dialogue like the one that we have now seen before. And you could also delete one of the existing ones. So means you can override everything before you finally now release it. And as we are anyway here, once you have sent it, you will see also everything here in the output history, right? which gives you a nice control over what has actually happened. So also these two requirements were easy to accomplish. And so not surprisingly, two additional requirements materialize in front of us. Things that we see pretty free, uh, often um, currently is uh, ways to make the printout more environmentally friendly. The one would be just to save paper, print at least the internal uh, printout double-sided. The other would be not to print at all and instead put it to um, um, some file directory, go with the PDFs also for this internal purpose that we will have. So how would we accomplish that? Now here, this is something we need the Cloud Print Manager for. The Cloud Print Manager is an add-in that you find as many other add-ins in the self-service overview, install additional software area. And the Cloud Print Manager is bridging the mile between the by design system itself and your local printers in your network. Um, while running, it will check the queues for new documents and put it to the corresponding um, printer. Yeah. So in order to do that, it needs to use some local service on your uh, Windows PC. So you install the Cloud Print Manager and together with it, you get these two services here that you can access via the Windows Start menu and uh, the Services app from Windows. And now, in order to make this run, you need to start the service. This takes two steps. The one is that you need to provide that service with your Windows credentials. Please do not use the defaulted local system account. That won't work. Instead, go to this account and give your, including your domain, uh, if applicable, um, your credentials. 
and then you can go here and start the actual service which is then running. Once you have done that, yeah, you will see here subcloud print service, the green uh, yeah, light running. Actually, what is this other watcher uh, service? This is an auxiliary service taking care that the print service is being restarted if required. Now, if that had been started, you can now go the next step with the Cloud Print Manager itself. To go the next step means you need to create something which is called the Runtime System. The Runtime System is now giving your Cloud Print Manager the information it needs to reach out to your by design system. What is that? There's of course the URL so that it finds the system and then it is the credential. And now it depends in which scenario are we? Are we now in the central printing scenario? Then you need the Cloud Print Manager exactly once in your network and at best at a server that is always available. And then from that place out, it takes care and distributes the documents to the printers as described here, um, depending on, as described in the queues actually. And then you need, and this is what I said, remember that user, that technical user, and, in, and give the credentials here. An alternative would be that this is being used by the document owner for getting help with still existing business document owner related tasks and then of course the business user needs to go here and then please don't forget to check the business user checkbox down here. As soon as this has been done, this, um, the setup here, um, the Cloud Print Manager reaches out for automation and displays the queues in that by design system that are visible to that user. Means we have here the sample of the central printing. Uh, with the technical user, the technical user sees the two queues that uh, we have created. And actually you see already um, how many documents are waiting in that queues. And now the interesting thing is if you go to the queues, right click output options, then this is the place where you actually indicate which printer um, is taking care of this queue. And here you can then even um, give some PDF settings um, using that button means giving some information on which tray to take if your printer has several and whether to, to use duplex printing and also how to handle the size. Um, very interesting in addition you have the possibility with the Cloud Manager Print Manager to in parallel or instead put the file as a in that case PDF file onto some local folder. And in both cases you have the opportunity to, to have also a possible attach, attachments of that uh, document added. Yeah. So this means also these additional requirements which are already pretty advanced can easily be accomplished. So I think we have seen a lot for up to here. And so I would like to just to, to summarize what we have seen and then come to a close for today. Um, we have seen the purpose of print queues and here especially the paradigm of central printing versus the default printing by document owner. We have seen then the necessity to create output channel rules. Um, we can create multiple rules and put them in the right sequence. Uh, so that the generic ones are at the bottom. The functionality used here needs to be activated in the PC. Exceptions, account specific exceptions can be defined in the account master data and um, individual exceptions for a specific transaction can be made in the trans transaction itself. And Finally, the Cloud Print Manager helps us to optimize the entire process to gap between the business by design system and um, the actual printers and gives us some, some several very helpful functionalities, among others, saving to um, a local file. So with a final view on to further reading material, I would like to thank you for your attention today. And yeah, I hope uh, you like what you have seen and I am looking forward to see you again in the next unit.
Mm -hmm. Goodbye for today. Welcome back to the Open SAP course for key users in SAP Business by Design. My name is Michael Roth and I am part of the product management team for By Design. Our topic for today are web services. By Design is rich in capabilities to integrate with other systems and web services are the main pillars for this. We will cover two families of web services supported by By Design in a very strong way. The one would be web services following the SOAP protocol and the other would be REST or data services. But first of all, let me ask the question, how could web services add value to your business? Well, it's about getting data in and out and about data and business integration. Imagine you have Material Master shared across several solutions and now you certainly want to keep them in sync. So replicating changes from one system to the other would be a perfect task for a web service. Similarly, you could uh, use web services to accomplish some mass change uh, tasks in addition to other mass change capabilities that the solution has. More from a business process side, you could think of a business process, let's say, a, let's say a sales process that is starting outside the system at one point, let's say at the sales order is entering by design, handed over to by design to be um, processed from there in the system. Um, also, this would be a perfect sample and presumably this is the uh, most frequent used web service in by design. You could do it also the other way around to have a business process in by design at it one point trigger a business process task in another solution via a web service call going out of by design. And then again from a totally different perspective you could develop uh, some external app let's say a mobile app and the user the user screen is interacting with the by design data, typically via OData services. And then another family of usages would be getting data out. By design is already rich in capabilities for business analytics, and this can now be prolongated for the consumption by an external um, remote system by allowing it to use report results, KPIs, or even enable access to the data sources behind it. So let's look into the first family of uh, web services, uh, the SOAP web services. By design has about 200 APIs here in that area, touching about 100 business objects. And let's look into the system where you would find them. In the application and user management work center, you have the service explorer. In the service explorer, let's say we are looking for web services for sales order. Typically, we see three entries. One entry is a query service to get data out of the system. And the other, this manage sales orders service is Create, allowing you to create and update sales orders. And typically you see a check operation as a sibling. This is a simulation mode for the same. Now I select one of these, the manage sales order service. And now I have down here um, the link to the documentation. This documentation explains field by field what this API is expecting. And the other most important part here is the download of the WSDL file, which is the structure information of that API that you would download and would then upload on the consumer side into the system or maybe into the um, web service test software that you have on your PC. You could alternatively go to the SAP API Business Hub, which has the same information. There you would also find here under the tab documents 
um, a general documentation um, that gives you an overview about um, how to use uh, SOAP services in business and by design uh, in general. Um, and here, let us get one step deeper and have a look onto some concepts presented in that documentation. Um, here you see the core part of a typical uh, payload uh, from a SOAP call to by design. This is about the material master and in the material master with this ID, this material master, this is the request to add a French description with that text. Okay, it's not really French, but anyway. Now, this little sample has already two concepts that are very central for the uh, SOAP requests to in by design. The one would be the action codes. Yeah? So here the action codes, a small a subset of the available action codes would be on the header level action code 06. Yeah, what would that mean? It tells the system to leave the header level as it is, to do nothing on the header level because that is not supposed to change. We want to add a description in the foreign languages. And so um, we have 06 in the header level and we have used action code 01, means creation. This is what we want. We want to create a foreign text in the descriptions. And this creation mode even takes care on exceptions in case there is already a French description in the system unexpectedly then um, the call comes back with, uh, with an error message, which is what we want, because then we can decide how to proceed. The other element that you see in that sample is, the list, is a sample of a list complete transmission indicator. So what are these indicators about? These indicators tell the system whether the list Let's, this is a list, it's a very short list of uh, one text entry, whether this list is to replace all foreign language uh, descriptions that are in the system for this material master, or whether it is to, to enrich them, to be added to them. Yeah? So true means replace, false means adding, this is what we want here. So here two typical samples and at this point I would just like to um, encourage you and invite you to get hands on and try yourself some, some SOAP calls in your by design system. Now let's get over to the OData side of the house. On the OData side we have more than 300 standard business objects for which you can generate OData service APIs and um, in addition you would also use your data to create APIs for all reports, KPIs and data sources that there are in SAP by design. Now let's get right into the system and try this ourselves. Here on my launch pad, I have this tile which is displaying a, a KPI. Yeah, these KPIs are prepared in the system and you can also define your own. And with these KPIs, you could create a kind of dashboard, for example, in the system so that you have the KPIs that are interesting for you um, here directly in the system available to you. Let's assume you want to expose this to the outside and uh, offer in your company a dashboard that is showing the KPIs from by design um, directly and refreshing itself, let's say, every minute. How would you do that? You would go to the business analytics area, work center and design KPIs. This here, the net invoice value, is already the KPI that you have just seen on the other screen. And just up here, our data service gives you already the URL that you need to expose. This is everything that you need to expose here. 
and it shows you already the result for a call. Well, the KPI is not a single, a single number. The KPI, you see the number part here, it comes with accompanied by a few additional informations like thresholds and like trend values, but this is the information that you get on requesting the KPI. And I just refresh it, the call is done again, and uh, this in case the invoice amount has changed, meanwhile you would see the fresh number. Now you could use that, and I would like to use Microsoft Excel as a very simple sample of uh, how such a consumption um, could, could be done. You could use that to use that to use the or data feed capabilities. So I drop the URL that by design has given me just here. And Microsoft Excel is querying now, sending this request to the by design system. And here you see 18,700, our value being called from by design into Microsoft Excel. And now you could of course do some, some formatting here to have a real dashboard. Another application for our data services is um, a subscri subscription for event notifications. Um, by design has always had uh, capabilities so that you as a user could be notified on certain changes in the system. Now a very recent uh, new functionality is that you could that expose also to an external remote system that could now subscribe for changes. Let's see here an example of uh, change in customer invoice. Now to be exact, the creation of a customer invoice is being subscribed here. And upon the creation of a new customer invoice, an endpoint, a service endpoint, a remote system that you have specify, can specify here will be notified triggering there some further processes. To use this, I said pretty often in, in this presentation, you can expose, you can see from the outside, yeah, this is to, uh, on your choice, um, um, meaning that the authorization of the access is under your full control. Every consumption here is assigned to some uh, work center view. And the work center views, like in the usage from your user, also here the work center views are the key connector for the authorization check, because also the um, web service access to the system is bound to a user, either a business user or a technical user. And only if that user is valid, and coming with the right authorization and having the right um, work center view assigned that is needed to see that data, then this web service call will be successful. For this, you have a few small preparation steps to set up. Um, you see that in the um, application and user management work center, a communication system where I define who is actually, what remote system is actually um, sending the request. A communication scenario where I can choose what interfaces uh, are being called here, are being addressed here, and then combining these two in a communication arrangement with, with a few additional information on how exactly this is done. Um, we have attached a file to the additional information to this unit with a few cheat sheets for the different usages um, that we have mentioned here. Also in the application user management work center, you might have seen already that you have a couple of monitoring tools that helps you to keep control and handle any exceptions during your web service calls. With this, we already come to the end of this unit. I hope you liked what you have seen. In case I could ignite some interest on your side for the web service topics, 
then here would be a few next steps to take. Yeah. A main resource is certainly the SAP Business by Design community page. I have just from the large number of articles um, cited few, four articles here and the names of two colleagues whom you certainly want to follow if this topic is for you. Please use the community page also to ask and raise any questions um, that you might come across during your own tests. You might also look out for some um, demo demos uh, published by, by SAP by Design Partners in YouTube and other platform platforms. And last not least, use the help portal to get more details. Best use it in the system itself because the help portal in the system, uh, the help center in the system is integrating actually both. There you have the classical help text as well as also the community uh, documents um, as a search result. So I thank you very much for your attention and I wish you luck with your next steps with web services in SAP Business by Design. Welcome back to the Open SAP course for key users in SAP Business by Design. My name is Michael Roth and I am part of the product management team for this solution. With today's unit, we are going to round off the topics of this week with a view on mass change in by design. We will see four different ways to do that. And on the other hand, on data extraction in by design. Let's go right into the first way. Mass change via mass data maintenance work center. Let's go into the system to, so, to see that. You see here there is a mass data maintenance work center. And this is dedicated to three objects with a very deep and rich hierarchy, which is customers, materials and suppliers. The principle is the same in all three cases. You download one of the tabs of the substructures into a CSV file. You modify the CSV file locally on your PC and then you re-upload it here on the right hand side. Just let's do that hands on. We are going into the customers and let's assume we run a quality project to improve the email address quality in our customer masters. I take just one of them for simplicity. Down here, you see this one account, this line, and I go over to the contact list. This is what I would like to work on. Now I see two contacts down here, and actually both of them are lacking their email addresses, so this project is fully justified. So let's export the data to Swift to CSV file. Uh, here the download is running. I have already downloaded that file and have already found out the correct uh, email addresses of these two contact persons and therefore now directly go on with first closing the export screen and then uploading the file here on the right hand side to the customer object. I choose the file. The CSV file is the one that we have just seen. Import data to tab. Well, this is not for the general tab. This is for the contacts tab. And now I import to the tab. Contacts. You see a data validation is being started. And you see a screen that maybe reminds you of something that you have seen at the beginning of the week in the sessions, in the sessions with my colleagues Tara and Carsten. Yes, this is very similar to the migration capability in by design. Same look and feel here. And actually, yes, here we are triggering the import here. We are not waiting for the import to finish. Instead, we head off to mass change number two. There are quite some applications which in addition offer their own mass change functions. Always 
focusing onto a certain frequent use case. A typical sample is the one in the product data, service master data. Let's go directly there, product data, services. Yeah. And let's assume we would like to do a mass change on these four selected um, service master records. Then I select them and click on mass change and I come to the mass change UI showing me these records. So where can I change, what can I change here? See, this is the other tabs, general sales valuation. I go for sales, let's assume I want to change the minimum order quantity and this is on that tab. Um, here in the header line, the screen line, you see the white ones are the fields that I can actually, uh, for which I can actually use this mass change. Let's assume I want to I want to raise the minimum order quantity, quantity for all these records to 8. Then I put a 8 onto the header line. I say apply, apply mass change to all items and you see the 8 is distributed out to the records. I say save and close and it's for all of them being saved back to the system. Um, let's check this. I go into one of these records. What I have changed is on um, the sales tab and down here, minimum order quantity, indeed, my 8 has arrived in the record, as expected. With that being successfully completed, let's go to number 3. This is a mass change that is using the SAP add-in for Microsoft Excel. Um, you might remember from the um, output management session that in the self-services overview on the home work center you have this install, install additional software um, view and there are a number of add-ins to be downloaded and installed among others the sap add-in for microsoft excel if you download that and install it onto your pc then actually you, in, on your Microsoft Excel, you will see an additional tab, this SAP Business by Design tab, with some by design related functionalities, among others, here to the left, the log on and log off functionality. This is maybe also the right moment to mention that, of course, each and every functionality that we saw today is fully secured by the authorization concept in Business by Design. Yeah, also here. And how is that uh, working? Well, um, from the applications that are using this functionality, like for example in the contact area, from that, let's go there to see it, account management context, to, to see it firsthand. Yeah. Here in the context area, you have this new context from Microsoft Excel and this is now using this functionality. What is this doing? It is actually downloading exactly this file, this XLSX file. Um, and if I, up, if I open that, I can populate it, it. And whenever I say save data to, then this is being sent to the by design system and saved there. Um, and yeah, actually it is using web service capabilities. So if you remember correctly our, um, our session, our previous session on web services, then it depends on the web service, uh, what you can do with it. In that case, you can actually create and update data, um, even override uh, the data. So um, for those of you who have watched closely, um, obviously this is Action Code 04, but this doesn't belong here. This is the session from the previous session. Let's stick with the session here and um, go to number four. Number four is uh, file input, adding data to the system via a WebDAV folder. What is a WebDAV folder? A WebDAV folder is a virtual directory in your system that can be accessed from the outside via the internet. And this WebDAV folder, you can either put files into via WebDAV specific functionalities that are available or via mounting that to your local network. Either way, 
you can put files now in the directory manually or have some remote um, mechanism store files there. So now we need inside BigBuddy the corresponding um, functionality to, yeah, what to do with that, those files. This is, you can schedule jobs specific for a certain um, interface that are regularly, if you usually create a schedule that's recur in a recurring way, regularly looking into that folder and whenever they find a new file, processing it, sending it to that interface. Um, this is being used by about two handful of uh, objects, uh, two prominent ones being supply invoice, customer invoice, and uh, a number of um, country specific lists that are using that. But even maybe more important than the standard objects, this can be used in a very strong way by, for custom objects. If you use PDI, and I know this buzzword is uh, coming early, it is uh, a topic later in that course, um, a key user development functionality to create your own business object, then you could, you will find a wizard that allows you to define the corresponding file structure and schema file, which is the structure definition that you can use here to set up here the corresponding web uh, folder for it. So that together you have a kind of migration for, um, for your business object. Saying that, let it be enough for data input and let's, let's come to the last topic for today, which is the data extraction from BYD. You might have seen already in the application and the, uh, and the application and user management work center, the data extraction view. And if not, then this is the reason. The reason is maybe that in your business configuration that has not been activated yet. This is a functionality that you need to explicitly activate in the uh, business configuration. How is that working? This is working in a way that for each object here, you can define a run, which is collecting the data and exporting it into, um, into a file that you can then download. Let's do that. Let's say new, you need a run ID that had not been used yet. Let's hope this is one that had not been used yet. And yeah, let's have maybe a look into the list just to see how long it is. Uh, I go with the materials for here. You have two choices to make. The one is, would you like to use packaging? This means you can limit the size of the, the file. So when I say 5,000 here, then not more than 5,000 records are going into a file and then a new file is being created for additional records. And if here in the other um, checkbox, I can decide whether I want to have for like countries, the code like FR for France, or whether I would like to see the long text like France in, in my extraction files, depending on what you are doing with that file, the one would, might be better or the other. We are going with description and activate and run. And this is now starting a batch job in the system, which means you could actually log off and come back later when the collection has been finalized and the files are, are ready. If you instead um, decide to stay here and watch, then I refresh the view and I see my uh, job running in process. And I refresh until it's finished. Let me just look into one that had already finished. Once it is finished and a little, give a little more time to it, a few seconds, then you will see down here the list of files that had actually been collected. And from here, you could then download it to your PC. And when you do that, then you will maybe be surprised to see that you know that file format already. Yes, it is exactly this migration template that you know from early in the week um, that we use also for the data extract extraction. So. Now, with the last slide, let us look into the rich number of objects that is supported by this uh, functionality, making this 
the main extraction functionality in business by design. Saying that, I would like to come to, come to a close for today. I uh, would like to thank you for your attention and I hope you like what you have seen and yeah, hope to see you again in the upcoming sessions. <laughs> Goodbye for today.